So I'm Tabitha Lovett. Thank you very much for joining us to talk about your philanthropy. Um, and you've called your philanthropy Paul, so it's Wilton Philanthropy yes. after your family. Yep. And, and when you decided to set it up, was it a deliberate decision to put your name to it? I know some people choose foundation names that are anonymous. Was it, it was one of those things that evolved and I'm actually having a discussion with my wife, Andrew, at the moment of whether we should actually change that and what we're talking about. Maybe it should be Wilton Social Impact. Oh yes, yeah. so it's broader in terms it's of what it's doing. It's broader because our, we are funded by our business. Okay, so we allocate between 20 and 50% of the profits we make. Right, we say we can give that away. That's a lot. Because yeah. when you think that the average distribution is 5% from a, a family foundation, and you're giving 20 to 50%. Yeah, yeah, depending on the year. Yeah. And so that's direct giving. So that may change. I might say we need to build a corpus up in, in a fund that we have. Right. Uh, we have a fund at the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, so it's a community fund. Uh, we may choose, not at this point in time, to actually go and actually put the money into there and let that build so that the next generation then has money to to actually allocate under a more oh. structured format. Yes, I see. So I yeah. had thought Wilton Philanthropy was the sub-fund of the Lord Mayor's Charitable Foundation, but it actually encompasses your corporate giving as well as the Correct. sub fund. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. So yes, we have the fund at LMCF called Wilton Philanthropy, but so Wilton Philanthropy as who we are is gets most of its most of its funding comes from my budget rent car franchises. And do you find when you're talking to people about the different projects that they're asking you to fund, are you starting to set those projects within a strategy, a, a sort of a framework that, that means you can listen to the different requests and, and know relatively quickly whether it's something that you'll fund? Well, absolutely, because we've made a lot of mistakes along the way uh, and you know it wasn't structured, so we've come down now to some very key pillars that we talk about women and girls are, are one of the major ones that we're, yeah. we're in. There is education, which actually ties into the women and girls as well. And then there's uh, health and education, health and uh, education uh, aspect is... of it. So they're the key things we do. One of the reasons that we're having this discussion, Andrew and I, about changing the name, we think we're creating false expectations of calling it Wilton Philanthropy. And it's like it's opened the floodgates of people requesting money and the like. And we only have a limited amount that we can give away. Mm. And we don't want to have this false expectation of uh, people going to a lot of work, you know, putting in grant requests and all that, when we actually have already set up, we know what we're going to give the next three years, yeah. and they're on specific projects. And, you know, and we've had to bring it back into doing bigger lots of money to it instead of spreading it too thinly there yes. to try and get this impact, which is why we're talking about should it be actually Wilton Social Impact? Which is interesting because then it is a way of managing expectations because it creates that narrative about these are larger commitments and you're working probably more in partnership with the organisations rather than it being that more reactive process where people come in with applications and then you sort of yeah. scatter it out. So yeah. yeah, and the last thing you want is to give false expectations. But the social impact, it, the other reason we're looking at is I'm trying to go green at work which is pretty hard when I've got, you know, 1,500 vehicles in rent a car and trucks and yeah. things like that. Yeah. So, you know, we're doing the obvious things of uh, solar and batteries and, you know, planting trees and all that. So, so we're saying we're going to have a social impact in our business, all right, and we've got to be working hard to actually, you know, looking after the environment, making sure our people are, uh, are, f are fully involved in that so we support our staff and helping them fund solar at home and things like that. Oh, so you would, it extends to the way your staff then lead yep. their lives as well. Yeah, so we've all, always said, it because of we tell our staff what the money's going to, we, yeah. we have a monthly newsletter of what we're doing, they actually can come to us. If they know a family that's in need or something that's happened, right? they can come to us and talk to it about that. Would we consider supporting this and that? So they actually feel part of the, the process. So yeah. as a franchise, we've become more profitable than the other franchises because you measure this because you've got to report your information. And that is because the staff, knowing that we're going to give away this money, they're prepared to work harder. So oh. they all stay back an extra half hour to, you know, get this booking that, you know, if someone's running late, they won't say, you know, sorry, we, we close at six o'clock or something. They'll wait because they know that's extra, that business, the money out of that, a portion of it is going to be part of yes. our philanthropy. I love the idea of that because mm -hmm. 
the, the motivation for the staff is that they're actually contributing to the community mm. by making the business thrive rather than it being just, I'm the worker and that's the person who ultimately benefits being the owner. Yeah, yeah. and another benefit out of it is we've actually got the longest serving staff members of any of the franchises yeah. in Australia out that's of any wonderful. of the brands. Yeah. Of uh, rent a car, so and, and you that, can you can measure that. it against yeah. the other the but, other franchise. And, and what it really it. gets is the partners of the people who who work there. They actually accept more that you know they're working hard and think that their you know husband or wife is working hard in our business because they can see the good that we're actually doing, and and they get a real buzz out of that and be, feeling part of it. Yeah, and I can imagine that because mm. if you think what a large percentage of your day is spent at work, and if you can work for an organisation or a company where the values and the philosophies are aligned with your own, or you feel that there's more work going on in the background than just profit generation, it, it just changes your whole philosophy about going to work because mm. you feel like you're part of something more meaningful than just sort of clocking in and clocking out. So yeah, yeah I can see yeah. where that would really add to staff satisfaction being yeah, a part so, of it. And so I imagine that wasn't the motivation when you when you sort of went no, down that you, path. It's yeah, happy. All this has been a, I, I've had a thing, I'm, as long as I'm going in a forward direction, mm. all right, I actually don't mind which fork in the road I will take, yeah. all right, as long as it's a positive forward thing. And it's taken me on some great journeys and into exploring different things based on that. So yeah, we, we didn't start saying that we would do this. I mean, I'm an old-fashioned uh, Christian, so we were brought up that, you know, 10% tithing yes. uh, the, 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 uh, with it. So yeah. there was always that 10% there that of me personally, but once we, once we got over the, the hump of, you know, extreme debt in the business, all right, and being comfortable that, you know, okay, there's a certain amount of debt which you have to have in the, you know, when you've got right, when you know, 1,500 vehicles and things, you, you will always have some debt. Yeah. But once you accept that that's that and it's manageable, then, it's, then you start looking, well, okay, we're going to get 10%, but, you know, can we do more? And then, then that comes into the question of how much is it enough? And I was wanting to talk to you about that because... Yeah. There were two things that I, I read when I was reading some of the articles on your website and then also you had some interviews with Philanthropy Australia and two things that struck me was you talked about your values and I was curious about whether you feel that the values that you learnt through that Christian upbringing sit relatively um, almost as a sort of a static underpinning of the way you conduct your business and your philanthropy or whether it's something that you do go back and revisit in terms of what are the priorities of your values? It's, it's interesting. Isn't it? Philanthropy, one of the deficits for the love of mankind. I mean, that, that is so aligned to the major religions, isn't it? Whether it be Jewish or Christian or Muslim or whatever, that, that, that there are core values in there. So it's a fairly easy sort of shift to actually align that to it, yeah. I find. And, and then what does it mean to, yeah. to try and honour that? Mm. And, but yeah. but the, how much is enough, is enough is a real thing. I've grown up in, in this, we, you know, my parents are ten-pound poms. Started with nothing. Yeah. All right. Started the business the with nothing, and some other people in in the same business of me have been on a similar journey. And I've actually watched them, and they haven't gone down the road that I have. And they are so preoccupied with still making money, that is what is driving them. But I can't see that they're happy. I can't. They're just continually driven. They've got to keep making money and got to keep investing and things like that. And I keep thinking, why? You know, you've, you've got enough to live. You know, how much do you how really much need? How much is enough? And I and I and I think about that a lot because often there's this idea of, this, you know, the society celebrates success. We celebrate um, sort of these scorecards in a way. You know, you have the two hundred fiftieth, fiftieth richest people being published in the Australian or the AFR. And I wonder to what extent. And I was curious about your views on this. To what extent it actually creates that competition so that people don't actually stop and think, is this about accumulating money to compete or is it about accumulating money because I've not questioned whether that's in itself a good reason. And, and the giving back seems to me to be the ultimate reward of success. And I, I was curious about whether you think that's one of the problems in our society, that there is that competition to be the richest and whether that then dissuades people from giving money away because they will then in the process compromise that ranking. So so where does the, the tall poppy syndrome fit into this argument? Because yeah. I think that had an effect on, on initially where people didn't want to be, 
this and have their name appear on something that they're giving away. Everyone, so they just kept on making money. Yes. All right, because yes. you can actually be quite quiet about making money and yeah, you can, and uh, doing it that way. But actually coming out and, and saying that you know, you know, I want to be you know it's, instead of anonymous giving, it's actually going to have their name it's on it. My name. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's been a really great change that I've seen in Australia that people are actually now prepared to do that mm. because it wasn't something there and. You know, fortunately, the uh, likes of the forests and the like, you know, coming out and making these strong statements, and the, and the likes of you know John John and Pauline Gandal, they really strong statements out of there, and yeah, big commitments uh, yeah. that they're making. And you know, you know, I found out studying the philanthropy in, in the states. You know, every major private hospital, every major education thing, has someone's name on the the building, and mm. significant money has gone in, and they've got great facilities. Mm. I came back here and I had a look here. All the names on the buildings were, you know, the headmaster or something who was there 20 years or some professor or something, this who had done so. And it looked further, you know, there wasn't any money going into these things. Now, that's starting to change now. The, shifting, the, I believe, uh, program at Melbourne University is a classic of that, of, uh, you know. Yeah, that's been very successful. Yeah. And Monash now has one as well. They're starting to um, secure some very large donations. Mm. But it is, I mean, the whole culture in America of giving also turns around this idea of the American dream, which is that anyone can succeed. And there's an expectation, I think, that when you do succeed, that you display that success and philanthropy is a part of that. And as you say, in Australia, there's probably been less of a comfort with being known to be a philanthropist because it, it then sort of puts you into an elite bracket. But I, I guess what I'm curious about is this idea of how do you work out what is enough? Because in any person's position, you can often look to people who have more or you can look to, you know, the whole um, narrative around consumerism and, you know, happiness lies in the next fast car or happiness lies in the big house or the travel. When you came to that realisation that you thought you had enough, was that something that you talked to your friends about? Was it, was it a conversation that, that took place publicly or was it much more an internal process? Yeah, it was a very much internal process and it's only actually looking back and reflecting. You know, I'd say I've got a PhD in hindsight. You know, yeah. You know, it's great, great to look back great. and see that, but it actually not that's not how it was planned or, or you know, the intent at the time, but it's uh, become that and I'm very happy that it's it's gone that way with it. So yeah. And and the conversation with your children, when you when when I talk to people about philanthropy, a lot of the discussion will be well, obviously I have an obligation or I have a, a desire to first help my family and to ensure that they're secure and that their needs are met. And then I'll think about giving. So giving sort of becomes the, you know, with the, with the leftover. And what we've seen come out of America now, and particularly with Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, is this willingness to say, well, I don't know that it's the best thing for my children to leave them my fortune. So it's a you know, conversation they're starting to have early with their children, which is I'll either get you involved in the philanthropy, in which case you get the reward and the satisfaction, or I'll just be very upfront about the fact that a large portion is going to go to charity. And so you can now sort of, you know, stand on your own two feet. And I was curious about, I know you've mentioned in interviews before that you've had conversations with your family about this. What, what are they like, those, those conversations? The, uh, I, I suppose the first thing I did with my kids is life's wrong. I came up with this, this, just the fact that life is wrong. You get your money at the end of your life, mm. right? When you actually need it is when you're starting a family, you're having kids and then you've got school. For, you don't have the money and it's really hard and you're having to spend extra time at work and you can't spend time with the family. Okay, yeah. You're right? worrying about When you about don't need that, and, it's actually, yeah. you know, you're there. And I sort of said, I, that being the case, I went to each of the kids and said, I'm going to buy you a house when you turn 21. All right. But don't expect too much at the end of the, end of the day when I'm gone out of a will. Yep. I'm actually going to give it to you now. And every one of them was actually clearly delighted about that and they don't have a problem with it and still don't have a problem with it. And they've got that knowledge then that that's, that's yeah, of what's what, going to of happen. what I did. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And in, in the whole history of America and their giving, they're fortunate there in that, that they're a much older society and we're mm. only 200 years old. So we've actually, we've missed out on this long term thing of families always doing it. You know, in, in America that giving is part of the budgetary cycle of, the, of a person. Mm. Whether you have a mortgage or pay rent or that, you know, they actually think that say, okay, 
here's this for rental, here's for mortgage, here's for entertainment, and here's for giving. Here's for giving. Right? Yeah. We don't have that as, as a thing. Not as much, and no. And part of the problem of moving away from a Judeo-Christian society where you know, the average families now are not involved in religion, and they're not having this education of the tithing and, and what it is. You know, I was at, at church a, a while back, and there was a Somalian lady there with her five children, and each of them was putting money into the plate as it went around. And it reminded me of where actually I got some of my core values in giving because yeah. I can remember, you know, putting the money in the plate and the minister telling us, you know, what they were supporting. Mm. All right. And some of this this week will be going towards X, Y and Z. And that had a profound impact on me at a young age, mm. saying something that me personally was actually going to have effect on a broader picture. And, the, and the, you absorb that message and you know what you're yeah. taking part in. Mm. And it does, it really resonates, that, that, yeah. that story. So yeah. to see that Somalian lady and her five kids, you know, because she's, she's teaching them. Right? But unfortunately, because we've moved away from that, that education's not happening. We're not sitting around the dinner table on a Sunday night talking about, you know, what we could, you know, do and what we can support and things like that. Right. That is much more of a conversation in America. Yes, it is. And it's one of the things that I particularly like about philanthropy when you see families create family foundations is that it actually creates a vehicle that requires the gathering together of the family to make decisions. And then those conversations need to happen because you're actually distributing income that you need to distribute. The family that I work for has three generations involved in their foundation. And they've actually carved out a pool for the third generation so that they can come together as cousins and decide which projects they're going to allocate funds to. And the conversations that come out of that group are fascinating because they're looking at things like indigenous rights, environment, animal welfare, um, you know, prisoners' rights. And you start to see that these conversations they're having are probably not the usual conversations that you would see cousins having around the table at a family event. But because they're in a philanthropic foundation, that that's very much the way the conversation goes. So that, that's one of the things that I hope family philanthropy will in some ways fill some of those gaps that have been left by people moving away from religion and not having those lessons early in yeah. church or at school. So, so that ties back into why I said before about I, I need to actually at some point in time start building a larger corpus yep. for them to have those conversations because at the moment, you know, I own the business 100%. It's my decision it's on what, your, what yep. I'm doing. Uh, the kids aren't involved in, in that because it's, they're not involved in the business. Mm. Although the good thing is my son's come back from Japan after 10 years. He's come into the business. So, oh, so we've got be there, something there. And my oldest daughter, who, who's had twins, they're a year old last Saturday, she is now saying, OK, I'm ready to actually get involved in, in some of the philanthropic stuff that we're doing. So, Well, see, that's fantastic because yeah. she would bring that... that empathy that you have when you have a young family. I, I remember travelling, I went back to equity trustees after my maternity leave and at that stage we were setting up the granting program for the ANSET Trust. So Sir, Sir Reginald ANSET had left this very significant gift in a charitable trust and had left a direction to assist children to take their place in life, which is a very broad um, description. But the types of applications that were coming in were for the most part, about children in incredibly difficult and vulnerable situations, whether it was health or socioeconomic status or neglect by a family. And I found myself crying on the train reading the applications because I had a, a you know, young child and you were able to imagine those things happening to your own family. And you just had this sort of flood of empathy, which really mm -hmm. then starts to sort of shape the way you, you look at the different requests that are coming in. So she would be fantastic at that, I imagine, because she yeah, would have and that, it's, that perspective. But I never wanted to push them. All right? yeah. I tried a little bit to, to manoeuvre it in the first place, and they clearly weren't ready for it at the time. Yes. Yeah. All right? So now two of them are. So I've got four, three girls and a boy, and uh, two of them are uh, ready to do it. So, for example, we're opening a, uh, an accommodation unit to at Northern Hospital that we've paid for. Yeah. An emergency uh, relief, is yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. So that's going to be open in three weeks' time. Andrew, they've asked Andrew and I to go for the opening of it, obviously. And you know, I said to Andrew last night, this is the time actually to, to move a bit here. So I've got a hold of Amy and Matthew, and they're actually going to go out and they'll be it. And I've just said, we're not going to be in the country, so is Good it OK man. if they come and do this? And they're, they're fine about it. But great this will you know, really get them into it. Yeah. Because I'll see the other side of it, what it actually... What does it mean by emergency relief accommodation? Yeah. 
Well, that would, they'll actually come across some of the people who are actually going to stay in it. And that will be profound. Yes, yes. You know, you don't forget that. When you see the people who are actually yeah. benefiting from the philanthropy, it, it really leaves yeah, an impression. Yeah. And, and likewise, being representatives of the family, they sort of start to get that comfort. Mm. Because I think sometimes family members resist the responsibility because they're worried that they'll go into an environment where they're out of their depth or they're being... Um, you know, treated in a way that's sort of, you know, special and they feel that, oh, well, I, I shouldn't be getting treated this way because it's, you know, my grandfather's money or it's my father's mm. money. But it's really about creating that idea of, well, this is the family legacy and the important work is what you're actually providing to people in need. So that's really the part to get connected to. Yeah. I'd, you know, on the 22nd of April, 1956, I won Tetzalotto. Did you? Oh, yeah, I was born here in Australia. Oh, yes, yes. And, and it, uh, that's an incredible yeah. thing to happen because my personal belief, this is the best country the best in the world country. without it. And the benefits that have come out of me, you know, I wasn't born in Somalia or I wasn't born in yeah. you know, the Middle East in a war zone or, or something like that, in yeah. a safe country over here that gives incredible opportunities to us. Mm -hmm. And I try to remind the children of that all the time and, and to actually take up what we have to offer here. Right, because a lot of people do take it for granted, and uh, this country has so much to to, to offer us. It and you know, does. it. I took our dog to the vet the other day, mm. and it was interesting. And she was in overnight, and the bill was nineteen hundred dollars, and she had a scan and something else. And it made me realise how blessed we are. Just if it was actually to do with medicine and a person. We wouldn't have paid a cent. Mm -hmm. You know, mm. we've got this incredible health, health system here system. that most countries do not have. Yeah. You know, over in America, this, is, this America's got some negatives as well. Yes. You know, a friend who had to get some keyhole surgery was in hospital for four days. Over there, the bill was ninety thousand yeah, dollars. Just. You know, if it was done here, you wouldn't have paid a, anything. We, we've got this incredible protection uh, thing around us here that. Uh, we have, so we really are blessed here. Oh, no, I absolutely agree. And I think that in some ways is why in America there is an expectation that people will be probably more generous with their philanthropy because they're aware that the safety net that we have here just doesn't exist in the same way that we enjoy, whether it's education, health, um, you know, just the, the sense of employment being, you know, more readily available. And, it, and I think that's why sometimes people become a little bit apathetic because they think, oh, well, the government provides and, you know, everyone can... You know, sort of make a good life for themselves, so I don't need to, you know, necessarily worry about the person, you know, in a in a worse off position to me. But I think it's often because they haven't had that first hand knowledge of mm. you know, what disadvantage looks like and feels like. So, and, and that's really challenging. We, we've got now seven thousand nine hundred kids in education in Bali in remote areas, and initially when we started this seventeen years ago, virtually no girls went to secondary school in the areas we were at. Mm. And so we'd actually pay for that for that to to happen. In my time, we'd never had one family ever say, "I don't want my child to go further in education." And all that. Yeah. Being chair of Life Education here for twenty years, and with Life Education, Healthy Harold, they go into a school and that, and we have a charge of ten dollars. And the reason we have that charge is we actually want the parent to be involved in asking a question: What's this money for? stimulate a conversation. What did you do with Healthy Harold? What happened in the van? So that they that. feel a bit more invested in what the yeah. child's participating they're not, in. They're not finding out what else is going on at school. Yeah. But it is so frustrating to me that over in the, for example, the western suburbs here, we get a whole group of parents who refuse to pay that. They believe, hey, the government should be paying it, not yeah. them. Yeah. But uh, they're not actually interested in their thing. You know, they're into third and fourth generation unemployment. Uh, yes, yes, that's right. Uh, that's right. There, there was a girl at, um, at one of the schools over there, and she got pregnant at 14, unfortunately. And I went over there, and we spoke to the parents about trying to get her back into the school. And the parents' view was, well, why? She'll go on to welfare, and, uh, and follow that's the pattern what we that's, did, that's, and that's, that's what that's, it Yeah, that and, happened before. And it was just no problem that they thought that way. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I just feel so sad and you know sorry for that child who's been brought into the world and that's what they're gonna and then the expectations yeah, that yeah. to overcome that would be such a huge step yeah. wouldn't it yeah and, and in this country it just doesn't need to happen yeah that's you know? right they're, that's why like everything's there for yeah. the for virtually the anyone who wants a job can can get a can job get one. Yeah. did you find after funding in Bali and I know you know often there'll be this discussion amongst philanthropists about what well, do we concentrate 
on projects in Australia because we live in Australia and you know we have an obligation to the country we live in and there are groups where there is genuine disadvantage and progress to be made. But then when you fund overseas and you see conditions in the third world or in countries that, you know, the population is much greater, the free education and health system doesn't exist, was it hard to then have the same empathy for local projects having funded in Bali? Uh, I wouldn't say empathy. What it, it showed the stark difference, mm. but it also made you look at what was here and actually quite often instead of people coming and and asking for money or whatever, we're actually saying, hold on, do you know that actually there are ways of actually getting over this? You don't need to be asking for money here. There's an agency or it's this or whatever who can actually help you. There's a government out funded there or service or, or, right. or, and it's a matter of, you know, this is, you don't know what you don't know, actually yeah. just pointing them in the right direction. Yeah. But, it, but our philanthropy is, is probably only uh, less than 5% is actually overseas. We're very Melbourne centric on what we do. So it's, it's about here, it's about local and, giving where we can actually see it and uh, it's in our own backyard. And that's the link with the business too, I imagine, that yep. that's the community in which you're operating. So there's a sense of then wanting to participate in that community. Yeah. And, and you know, we, we knew in life education to tackle drugs and that there's three three areas involved. You've got to have the, the child involved or the, the person involved. Mm. You need their family involved and you need the community involved. And unless those three things are actually working together, you're going to struggle actually to have good outcomes yeah. with it. So community's always been significant there. I've had my franchises 30, 35 years. One of the first things I did was actually take on a sponsorship at Boxhill Hawks. Yeah, how did years. that come about? Uh, at, because of my desire to actually want to associate with the community. We actually said, You were on, in Box Hill? Yeah, yeah, and that was my first franchise out oh, at Box I Hill. So I, I said, you know, if I'm expecting the community to come from me and, you know, rent from me and, uh, help my business a lot, I've actually got to be giving back to them. So yeah. I got involved at that. Basically within six weeks of starting that, I actually went down to the Box Hill Hawks and said, uh, what have you got in sponsorship? What, so what right, are the opportunities? Right. Yeah, how can I help you? And the first thing we did was actually not money, it was about giving them a van so they could, ah. for their away game, so they could actually load everything up. And It's like the wish they, list of every club and yeah. Yeah, charity that I come across. And yeah. you talked about funding the Hawthorne Girls Club. Now, what's yep. how do you refer to it? It's the, the Hawthorne VFL. No, it, Hawth so, so normally it would have been Box Hill Hawks VFL women team, but uh, Jeff Kennett at Hawthorne has said, we're gonna make a real statement here and we're gonna have the boys team and the girls team and we're gonna actually run them side by side and give those girls the benefit that our our male players are doing. Unfortunately, they didn't get the license. All right, yes. so this is all part of being ready to move into the AFL women's, women's team. Women's team. And, and he very cleverly said, we're gonna call it Hawthorne Women's Football Team. Yes. Even though they're not actually AFL at the moment, we're gonna treat it as it and is. And they'll be ready once the license uh, comes through. Yeah. Again, you know, this is it's a bit like golf as well. There was a real reluctance of businesses to put money into these starting things. Whereas I said, hold on, we, because part of our philanthropy is women, and, women girls, and girls, is actually supporting this. So we actually specifically did it for two years. And uh, this is the last last of the two years for that on it. And put significant money into that to get it going. Mm. Right? That enabled those girls to actually be paid as well which wasn't happening in the other VFL women's teams. Oh, that, I believe Hawthorne was one of the first clubs Correct. to pay and its female players. Jeff again has, you know, very strong on that and making sure, well, hold on, why aren't they getting, you know, a decent pay? Yes, If we expect them to give quality. up their time, you know, they can't work full-time jobs and that to, to get up to the level of fitness, we need to actually be doing the right thing. Isn't that a great demonstration yeah. of equality when you actually say, well, make sure the conditions are the same as well as the recognition. It's walking the talk, isn't it? It, it, really, it really is. Yeah, and that, that's what shifts people's attitudes yeah. about valuing women's footballs when they see it being taken seriously by the clubs. So yeah. another one that we, we do is the Australian uh, Masters of, Amateur Masters of Golf. So that was been going in Australia, so that's where you get the green jacket and all that, but for mm. amateurs, mm. been going for 27 years in Australia no women's team, only male. And the reason is they could never get anyone to sponsor the women. So I said to them, I said, okay, I will do this and we've taken it on for a five year period. So this is our second year of doing it. This year we had 16 girls from overseas come into it. 
this is uh, now a, a major thing and the opportunity that's got them is just incredible. We will be able to walk away from that. They'll be able to get sponsors now. Sponsor. It's actually, it's got some profile it's building. That's yeah, that's all groundbreaking. It needed. But to actually get that, you know, the start going yeah. is really difficult for them. They just, you know, they actually, tr it's not as though they didn't want to do it. They actually tried, but no one actually wanted to put the money in. And, and they would have had no precedent to see that there's a benefit in putting money in. So yeah. the corporate sponsors are probably, or all the people who are controlling those budgets are probably thinking, well, I can't risk this limited pool of money on something that might not get any coverage or any sort of ripple effect. And then if you go in and start it and demonstrate that, then corporate sponsors step in and, and can take over. But the beauty of having your own company is it, quite often some of these decisions on what you do, you know, you'll have, you know, some guru has got a PhD and there's a say, yes. value for money, that's actually not a good investment and all yes, that. Yes. Well, I can be a bit outside of that and say, listen, I'm not doing this, I will use the budget branding for that, uh, for example. I've got, you know, 700 trucks running around the streets of Melbourne with, you know, moving billboards with budget. I actually don't need to have, you know, any more budget on a, you know, someone's uniform. It, it, it doesn't mean a lot. Yeah. So, but that's not why I'm doing it. It's a doing it to support the women. That's uh, really... The thing. So, it must be it, incredibly satisfying when you can actually, I mean, you were talking about lining up that focus on women and girls, and then you've got the, the interest already with Hawthorne, and then you see that alignment between supporting the women's team, and then that then obviously gives you the realisation that golf is another sport where women aren't being fairly represented. And it must be incredibly satisfying to see the ripple effect of all of these decisions. Yeah, and you know, thank goodness society is, is, is changing because again, you talk about you know, winning tax lotto and that. Mm. In that era, the other part of winning tax lotto was Being on born a male, yep. right? The opportunities in that. And what we really have seen in, in Bali and our, our learnings out of that is how unfair it is to be born a, a girl in that society, mm. all right? Strong Muslim. The girl, when she marries, leaves the family home, goes to the male's house. Yep. So, so her family won't put the money into education if they've got limited money, it will all go towards the boys first. If there's anything left over, she might get educated in secondary. Mm. And that's why, if you have a look in, in Indonesia, the labourers are women. Because of the investment in their education hasn't They, they haven't made. had it, so yeah, they go get, lowest level And the guys get, it, get all the opportunity. And it was just so stark and it, it was very confronting to actually see that. So over there, so we really push the women. We, we have 20 odd scholarships a year to go to university for the girls. In, in Indonesia? Yep. yep. Uh, with it, and having incredible results. Our first year that we went in, we got a girl who was going to go into the, the rice fields at 10 years of age. All right, we got her to go to secondary school. She then went into uh, civil engineering at Denpasar Polytechnic. 600 students at the thing, only six girls. She came second in the school and she's now doing a PhD at Amsterdam University. Oh, see, that's stunning. And then yeah. that creates a role model for the girls who are in her immediate yeah. orbit as well, which is one of the things that when you were talking before about the 16 women who are now playing golf at that master's level, they actually, that actually creates the impression for the younger girls coming up that this is something that they can aspire to as well. It just, it just shifts the whole picture that girls are then growing up in, mm. which is really important. Do you find, when you're talking about these stories and you can see the tangible outcomes of your philanthropy, do you find that you have these conversations with your colleagues and your peers who are in a position where financially they can give as well? Is that, is that something that you get to share with them? I do. I'm, in my business communities, I'm very much pushing the community fund model, all right? Yeah. Because it's, you know, if you... If you start talking about PAFs and things like that, you yes. scare them off. Yes, yes. All right, and it is, you know, you need three quarters of a million to start and all that. The beauty of, say, a Lord Mayor's Charitable Fund, you can start it, you don't have all the legal complications, you don't have to fill out the 52 forms a year, yeah. you don't have to have it ordered and everything, it's all done. You can start it from $2,000. Yes. And it is a great way to get people started on a journey. So yeah. I had this conversation with a lot of them and they've gone and done it. And they've set them up. And, and all then, of a sudden they actually they get enthused because they're, they're getting information from Lord Mayors about some of the projects they're doing and uh, this and some suggestions. And uh, yeah. you know, they run a great service that they'll vet any grants that are that you've uh, got uh, yeah, received. Yeah, at no charge. And, uh, I'm a big fan of the community foundation model. Yeah. It's one of the things I find interesting when I'm talking to people about, and once you get interested in philanthropy, it you know, becomes your favourite topic, I find. And when people 
put up that resistance, which is I'd rather just give to a few charities each year directly. And then often the question I'll ask them is, well, how much would that add up to? And it's often five, ten thousand dollars $10,000. And then you give them the example, which is, well, if you were to set up a sub fund with one of the community foundations, and there's lots to choose from, and you put that money in, you get your tax deduction straight away for that full amount. And then the money sits there generating its income and its capital growth in a tax-free environment. So it's actually growing. And then you're distributing directly from that sub fund out to charities. So you're still getting money out to the charities each year, but it's just a much more effective way of doing it. And then you get the satisfaction of being more attached to it as well, because mm. you can put your name to it or you can give it a name, or, you know, whatever name you like. But there's that sense of it, it belongs, it, it actually has a, a sort of an, an existence rather than it being just sort of checkbook giving. Mm. So I, I think it's a really compelling message if uh, people hear it. Yeah, and, and when I sort of started pushing that, it, it was at a time when the investment houses were pushing PAFs. Yes. All right. Yeah. But they were pushing PAFs to get a control of a of money a that they can manage and actually earn fees out That's of. That's right. That's and right. And they weren't giving proper advice or a lot of advice on, you know, the, the mandatory distributions each year. Uh, that you know, and they certainly weren't talking, having discussions about should some of your portfolio go into a social impact type share or yes, something are, are was you, just because yes. just focusing everything on we've got to have the best return for them. Yes. All right. That's what it is. Whereas it shouldn't. So I actually said, get over here because you're not going to have that. that you know, community foundation. Foundation. Yeah. But what people probably aren't aware of, I can actually move my uh, fund at Lord Mayor's into my own PAF at any time. Yes, yes. Portability. Yeah. So so you yeah. can actually build these things up and do it. So I, I could. I actually don't want to. I don't want to be in that. I don't want the, the onus of audits and this. I'd, you know, I'm an accountant myself. I've had enough of all these, these <laughs> things. You actually reduce those things. Just do it nice and simple. And, you know, if you take Lord Mayor's case, they are so diligent and, and the projects that they're coming up with are, are just so good, all Melbourne-centric, yeah. which I like. Yeah. And uh, Properly researched. Yeah, they and, are and very you just diligent. got real confidence at what you're doing. Because as yeah. I said initially, we've made mistakes in this. You know, quite yeah, a few. I was few curious when you said that. When you said you've made mistakes, what what would you give as an example of a mistake uh, that you've made in philanthropy, or even just a sort of an impression? Uh, so of... supporting some charities where the um, duplication, they were actually you know doing what someone else was doing. Some yeah. are actually doing things that actually the government actually do. It's a bit of that getting the right direction. Yes. Uh, you know, the classic is. There are so many charities, and so we've got two and a half thousand breast cancer charities because every time yes. Aunt Jean dies, someone, someone sets wants to something up in their name or in their memory. And you know, I, th I think the figures were that you know the average charity raises eighty-seven thousand dollars and spends sixty-two thousand dollars raising that, which is just a flawed yes, model. It is, isn't it? And whereas okay. you can go and open a sub fund under you know Auntie Jean's whatever fund, have it there, get people to donate to it. It's all nice and clean. They get a tax deduction, and the money can then be sent to a an established DGR registered charity that's already doing the work. And has the and staff, you're not creating, and has the expertise. Yeah, you're not going to create another bureaucracy, another you oh. know, another office, a back out office, and all these other associated costs. So yeah. it's a real beauty of it. I, I agree. I completely agree. It's one of the things, it was one of my favourite parts of working in philanthropy was giving people that advice about how best to do it. And you have these conversations where you say, well, what's the part that you really want to be involved in? Is it the giving or the investments? Because if it's not the investments, then put it into a community foundation, which is well invested and spend your time focusing on the distributions, the charities and the projects that you want to be a part of. You do have some people who are very good at investing and they really want to lend that skill to their private ancillary foundation so that then they can sort of, you know, play in the area that they feel is their strength. And in that instance, I would say all oh, private ancillary foundation is probably a good match. But otherwise, unless that investment aspect is really important to them, being in control of the investments, I would always recommend a community foundation mm. or a sub fund with a public ancillary foundation over a private ancillary foundation. Yeah, so it's an interesting thing. You know, when I first got into the share market, I thought, this is great. I'll, you know, cleared a bit of debt at work. Well, I should diversify a bit, have some shit. And so to actually keep up to date, the amount of reading you needed and everything else, and the yeah. fact is anything information I was get was, you know, it's, it, it's old information. Yes, yeah. And, and, you know, and I thought I was, you know, saving myself some money. And, and I have this view now with a lot of things, mm. pay someone to do it, all right, get the right advice and do it. So I, I've, both JB Weir and ANZ Private look after 
our investors. And I'm happy to pay that money knowing that it's that I actually don't need to go and read a whole lot of things. I don't have to read anyone's yeah. annual report. I don't have to be up with, you know, you know, looking in case, so, you know, staying ahead of the market yes, to yes, sell out yes, before yes, something goes. Yes, yes, to try and stay ahead yeah, of all I, of the different I, trends yeah, and movements. I just look at the report that says they've done well. Thank yeah, you very much. Happy, happy to that. pay to that. <laughs> no, and, I it is, and then I can agree. concentrate on others. But I, uh, and so I'm constantly looking at what things should I be doing, what things shouldn't I be doing, and really, what can I, you know, pay someone to do if it's not going to be effective enough for what, me to do it? What can you or, outsource? Or wasting a lot of my time. Yeah, and and the fact the act of outsourcing, and this is actually one of the things I preach about in some ways, the act of outsourcing creates employment and creates opportunity for other people. So if, the, if you're comfortable with the outsourcing, it's actually in its own way. Yeah, contributing to the economy, so it's not such but a But you're also going to generally have better results. Yes, if you give it to right. someone who knows what they're doing. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I recently, I'm not sure whether you went and saw the, the former CEO of uh, uh, PepsiCo who was in town talking no. here, and uh, incredible woman, Indian woman, um, yeah. and her number one thing in life is to keep on learning, and it was a really good take out of it, and I'd, I've always tried to keep on learning and things. But once I've learned something, is when I decide, do I want you want to be doing it, or will I, will I if it's valid, will I hive it off? Yeah. yeah. How do you? How do you? you I've, I've read in one of your interviews that that comment that you have that endless curiosity and, and interest in learning. How do you decide how to allocate your time? Because running a business, four children, um, you know, wife, you know, nine hobbies, grandchildren now, nine grandchildren. Yeah. So and then a big business, and then your yeah. philanthropy as well. How do you how do you decide that with everything that comes across your table? How do you decide how to allocate your time? Okay, so I, I'm really lucky that we the businesses are under a tier one franchise, which is uh, like a McDonald's, that's so Avis Budget Group out of New York. Um, they are actually doing all the hard work on the marketing, on the IT systems and doing that. So, so the back end is... The back end. So, yeah, yeah we pay a 10% royalty or something. But that is, I consider that cheap for not having to worry about any of that. Yep. So what I then need is good operators of my business. So my CEOs and things like that are very, you know, all they're going to do is turn up, really, and follow yeah. the procedures, you know, yeah. like a McDonald's. Yeah. There's only one way to make a Big Mac, yeah. all right, and you're just going to, that's the only way we're going to do it, all right, and if you do that, you're going to be successful. Right. And uh, so that's that's always what, yeah. and because of the, having the longer staff and, and them being engaged with us, I have total confidence in what they're doing, so I, I can actually have a look at my business for 15 minutes in the morning, which is usually about 4.30 in the morning because I'm an early riser. Early riser. I can look at the, the KPIs of the day before and everything and know exactly what's happening. And, and, right. and therefore I don't need to to, to, them. to, to be sitting on it all day yeah. and, and micromanaging it. And, yeah, and yeah. sitting on them in effect. Yeah, isn't right, it? You know, right. If, all right. You pay them, let them get, it, get on with it. Yeah. And be prepared for them to make a mistake. You know, it's just one of them, you know, one of my new general managers said, oh, listen, I made this thing, I've done it. I said, Michael, don't worry about it. Or it won't be the last one, you know. So these things happen. Nice approach. But, but what you did is you actually had a go yeah. and you tried it, all right? And identified when it went wrong. Yeah. yeah. And, and now, you know, you won't do that again. But, but I've got to say, I, I much prefer to you trying something new and trying that, you know, there are a couple of vehicles that we, we wouldn't normally put in fleet. We got them because you thought there's a real market for this. And it was... And there wasn't a market there for wasn't. it. There wasn't. They sat in the yard for six months, both of these, you know, $150,000 machines. Oh, right. And they went on rent. I think one of them went on rent for a day in six months and the other one didn't turn a wheel. So we just said, okay, yeah. sell them. No market. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We had a punt. But I much prefer, Michael, that you actually went out and had a go at it than, than not. Yeah. And, and do you take that, that approach? So when, when you're asked to do things, then you must get asked to sit on boards and to be on foundation boards and I imagine you know different um, people when they know that you're involved in philanthropy would be wanting to get your sort of ideas on what they should be doing. How do you how do you filter through those okay. requests? So I'm trying, I've been actively getting off boards all right and I think it I think the other thing is it's a bit hard when you're giving away money and being on a board there's an expectation that, that, that they want you to yes, that actually you'll contribute give to them. more. Um, so I've cut it right back now uh, to it. Angela's on five boards at the moment um, yeah, with it. and uh, But she's actually coming to the same realisation that really they've actually got her on the boards for this. And, and she's passionate about all the causes. Yeah, yeah. 
but it's actually the amount of time it's taking up is actually stopping some other things going on and uh, and that. We more consult, sort of consulting, giving advice to different boards and talking to them about what we think, how it should be, making sure they've got the you know, right sort of thing of board turnovers and Did all those. Good governance. Good governance. And, yeah. You know, uh, we're, again, we're so lucky we've got the ACNC here. Yeah. You can actually go on there. I mean, any charity or, or you know, who doesn't use the ACNC constitution and spends, you know, a fortune getting, getting one, one done up scratch. that's going to be problematic for them down the track, it, they're nuts. Yeah. All the stuff is there. The policies are there. Just yeah. go and take those. Yeah. Right? They, they've actually been well thought out. Yeah, the framework's there. Yeah, it's to there. Be, to be used, use that framework. It? Don't go and, re, you know... Recreate it. I agree. I mean, I've, I've, the Charities Commission, I think, is a fantastic mm. organisation and should go from strength to strength, which there has been, you know, some debate over the last six years because obviously the government that's in power now at one point, you know, was sort of looking to, to reduce their role, which brings me to one question I did want to ask you about government and the intersection between government and philanthropy. Do you see things that government could do better or differently to encourage philanthropy? Ah, oh, certainly. And, and uh, Philanthropy Australia, I'm a... Uh, uh, philanthropy champion for Philanthropy Australia, so we put funding into there for both administrative funding, but we also partly fund their storyteller. Oh, that's a great role. Because that's, a storyteller yeah. is, you know, keep, it's one of the things I say to charity. What's your yeah. story? Yeah. What, right? what will because, people take well, away when they? Well, you know, hear. I go and pick up something. I said, You've there lost is me. no cut through. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. And, yeah. and you and read so much. If you expect so to much. get someone quickly on it, because everything's about the grab now. Yeah. Right? It's you know. It's, Politics is about the 30 second news it cycle. Is, it is. Well, so is this. Yes. All right, unless you've got your story right and all that. But people want to be engaged with good stories. So uh, that's, that's really important. That's to a great it. role to be supporting. And, yeah. and do you, so you're obviously aware of the, the different advocacy that the Philanthropy Australia Peak does with government, yeah. where they talk about, you know, fixing up fundraising legislation or making sure that there's no restriction on funding advocacy and different things yeah. which we've had those conversations about. Yeah, so I've been involved in some of those conversations. Philanthropy Australia had the uh, the minister and shadow minister in uh, before the election there and basically grilled that. them uh, about what, what their intention is. And they are, they've been great at looking at what happens around the world. So one of the great things in America is a, charity, a fund can actually give money to a charity, all right, but actually the charity pays it back. How does that work? So, so you know, uh, uh, under your compulsory oh, you distribution. Lend. You can, yeah. Yeah, it can actually be, lit. so the, the Ford Foundation, for example, you know, they'll put some big money in this thing mm. for basically a social investment. Yes, yes, because right. that way they're actually giving, right. they're investing Bec in them the same way yeah. they would a business. And, and because so many charities <coughs> can't get funding, mm. yeah. Yeah. even if it's a viable project, all right, and it's you know, and it makes sense. They can't go and get funding for it. Yeah. All right, the banks just aren't going to do it. Yeah. Or whoever's. Yeah. That. So, so they're going out there. They're, in effect, they're either loaning at no interest or a small interest rate, but it is actually paid back. And so you're doing good, but it's actually the money then is coming back into the foundation to do more good. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, yeah. so there's some strong conversation about allowing that to happen in Australia. So that would be one initiative the government could take yeah, up here could that take would, it. would, would so, open uh, up a whole other raft of funds for not-for-profits. Correct, yeah. Right, that's a good but, one. But making it, making it easier in that sense to do, to do it. Yeah. The, um, at the moment, it is actually easier to actually get a charity DGR status for overseas giving. And there's, a, there's a window open for whatever reason, I don't know. So mm. uh, that is good because it has been virtually impossible to get yeah. uh, an overseas thing. I'm involved in a charity called the Mast Foundation, which recycles uh, medical equipment and sends it to, initially it was to Bali, but third world things. We, uh, Minter Ellis and I think the, the pro bono bill was about uh, $550,000 for it. That's enormous. It was four years in the thing and it was only but someone knew, the Prime Minister, who got him to... to Specially list it. To tell it? Peter Costello, you are going to improve this because he was saying, no, 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 we don't, we're not doing any of this. No. Right. Because they take the view rightly that, you know, when they get DGR status, right, all of us are actually paying for, for yes. that tax deduction yes. for them. That, that's, right? that's it, the, it is at a cost. Absolutely. The right? simplest and, and explanation, it, isn't it? So yeah. Every time an organisation is awarded deductible gift recipient status, the, the government is effectively giving away 
what would have been the tax that was paid Correct. to them. So, yes. Uh, and that tax is what funds all our other things all we have. All the services, so, yes. You know, there's, yeah. Yeah, there's the old scales here. You've got to yeah. make sure it's to get it right there. So, yeah. yes, it does need controls because otherwise we're not going to have the money over here to actually uh, support them. And, and, yeah. and in this country, you know, the government does fund a lot of charitable work. Yes. Right. Well, I mean, that's one of the They deliver, things. you know, the Salvation Armies, the Smithfield. They are Anglicare. They're out there doing a lot of things. And yes, they're getting government funding for it, but they're doing what the government is not doing. Yes. And the government accept that. Yes, that's right. They're, they're acting in the, in the shoes of government by being yeah. funded with, with mm -hmm. government contracts. Do you ever see a risk? I mean, you must have funded a lot of charities, worked with a lot of charities. Do you sometimes see that cycle being a problem where if an organisation has been set up to service a particular vulnerable cohort, that that then um, acts as a deterrent from solving some of those problems because it starts to become a bit of a sort of an output driven relationship? Output driven is, I'm not, not sure of that, but, but what I know is this real problem of charities changing what they're doing to being going for specific funding, government funding. Yeah. So the Clontuff Foundation, for example, which is a, a, about uh, getting boys, Aboriginal boys, to schools, all right, and getting them into AFL games. They had a they had a uh, grant. I think it was about twenty four million dollars. All of a sudden, about fourteen different charities went and started to do that, applying to the government for funding and doing all that. And guess what? Two years later, Clontuff got their money cut. Yes, right. because there's, there's, there's too many spread. people out there. It's all too hard. Yeah. All right. We, yeah. We're we're, up, we're upsetting people by giving you all this money. All right. We're not going to give it to them, so we're just not going to give it. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, I I've seen that happen where there'll be almost a trend or a particular thing that everyone wants to fund, and so charities will sort of start to shift their their programs or their focus to try and be eligible for those funds. Well, it's and happening they, they right now off. with the NDIS. Right. There's yes. quite a few charities changing their things because they're thinking they can get they're in they're trying to, to market yeah, to A lot of it's budget. very valid, some of it's not. Yeah, you do get some bad yeah. outcomes as well. Mm. And when you um, mentioned the family becoming uh, incrementally involved in your philanthropy, but I know you and Angela do it very much together. What, what's that been like, working you know, in philanthropy with, with your partner? Is it, is it something that you talk about a lot? You know, yeah, or is it something it's an absolute joy. This is my second marriage yeah. uh, and, uh, and Angela's second marriage. And so it's, uh, it is great to be you know, doing that. It's, it's not that we've grown old together. It's actually, this is all yeah. new experiences. And, yeah. and it is, you know, it is. We actually talk to each other. <laughs> <laughs> There's endless things to talk about yeah, when there, you're involved there is, in philanthropy. And it's, and it's quite exciting. And, and she's brought her bent to it. She ran a... Uh, a Swiss dental company in Australia and New Zealand for 20 odd years and retired two years ago. So she's got a, a bent there towards some of that area Health there. So focus. one of the boards she's on is uh, Evident, which is uh, about research into dental areas and things. So yep. she's bringing her own sort of things there. We've, yes. uh, we've, we've both had family members who are um, been caught up in the drug cycle. All right, so right. you know she's on the board of First Step, which is a, a charity based out of St Kilda. Oh, I know First Step. Yeah, yeah and uh, so she's there, and we support First Step as well. And uh, so, so we're each bringing things into it. She, yeah. uh, as I said before, I was you know chair of Life Education for twenty years. Angela came on to the board of that. Well, I actually got on. She's she's was deputy chair of uh, until last instant on the the board. So she's, yeah, so they're yeah. different. So, so, so some interests sort of are aligned, and yeah. then others you do other things on your own. Yeah. And I suppose right. I've had a lot longer history of being on not-for-profit boards, and so this is a new experience for her. And yeah, uh, and she's enjoying it. Yeah, and, yeah, very much. I mean, yeah. a favourite. She's on the board of guide dogs, and that's her favourite because oh, she gets to go out and fantastic. cuddle the, the puppies. Puppies, yeah, I know. Yeah. That was always what the ones that used, they used to bring them into the workplace, and everyone would just melt. It was just such an immediate sort of response. You could see it. Yeah. So she took yeah. her daughter and her two-year-old out there uh, last last Friday, actually, and I saw some of the photos. And just <laughs> 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 that is stunning. Do yeah. you? So what? What would be if you were speaking to people or people were listening to this? discussion and thinking about going into philanthropy, what would be sort of your tips? What would be some of your recommendations? Uh, stand back and watch for a little while. Uh, but it, a lot of what I do is actually actually fundraising. All right, so it's not just about giving it out, it's actually engaging people on, 
on money. So I was campaign chair for the Guide Dogs $23 million redevelopment. Oh, I love that initiative where yeah. they're going to set it up with... Um, Five different revenue streams yes, to it's it. it's such a clever idea. And, uh, we were able to fund that in uh, 18 months. Uh, we put a million in ourselves into it. Yeah. In the thing, Gandals are in there, Potters, uh, state government, federal government. And it's a game changer because you're going to bring revenue streams there that's going to make them less dependent on their handout to it. So yes, those annual f fundraising cycles will not be as pressured yeah. because they're actually doing things like it was going to be grooming, dog grooming, do dog care. Uh, Dog daycare. Dog daycare. So, so right. my beautiful Bella, this, the uh, miniature dash hound, we pay more to have her looked after at Diggity Doggity Daycare than we do for my uh, granddaughter. <laughs> That's at, extraordinary, uh, isn't it? So that is it, such it, a it shift is. in the... Uh, and, you know, so many people live in apartments now and things like yeah. that. you actually got to get socialisation for your dog. You do, otherwise they go work. crazy when yeah. you come home. Just, and yeah. so to put them in there, and of course they've got such a big volunteer uh, network, yeah. they're not going to have to pay the wages. Yeah. Right. So that'll be a big money in for it. They're going to have a, a dog-friendly cafe there on the banks of the air. Yeah. They're not going to run it themselves. They, they say, listen, we're not into running cafes. Right? We'll yeah. lease it out, but what we're going to do is we're going to make a condition that you hire some visually impaired people as yes. part of that. Yes, get right? that alignment between the services and the, and the business. And there you've got a revenue stream. Yeah. They're going to have some you know, consultant rooms that will be uh, rented out to low vision specialists. Again, another revenue source. They're going to have a veterinary clinic there. Hopefully, we'll say the University of Melbourne, so vets will be trained there. One of their biggest costs is actually a vet cost for the, for the dogs. That yeah. will get looked after in there. But it'll also the public can then come in there as well and have it. But again, you know, a great... It opens up that awareness too of, of, of the work of the guide dogs. But it also brings people onto the site. Yeah. And also the vets are going to have a long-term then association, these new vets with guide dogs. Uh, and they'll be lifelong supporters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They'll be uh, that, that, that so affiliation, will It's always subtle benefits... But, about it. But you know, that's what I find fascinating because when you think about people who've been successful in business, your ability to assess the viability of that social enterprise would have been so much more instinctive than someone who's just a grant maker, not just a grant maker, because often that's one of the things I find is when you work in philanthropy and your role is to assess applications that come through and you can put a framework across it, you can do your due diligence, you can speak to people who know the organisation, but often the philanthropists who have a business background are incredibly astute at assessing whether a project's going to work or whether a social enterprise is going to work because they've actually got that experience of what it takes to run a business or, or an, an entity that's actually going to thrive. So do you find when you're talking to people who are in business that you can then say to them, these skills are completely transferable to philanthropy or completely transferable to, to the world of not-for-profits? So we give a lot of advice to whether they want to hear it or not, to, to a lot of charities. Yeah. And the major advice that we always start off by saying is, this is a business, all right? You've got to run this as a business. Yeah. Right? Forget the heartfelt thing. Cause, yeah. You know, normally what we found is that, you know, virtually it's made up of the founders or people with passionate hearts about the cause. Yes. That's all right? And it's actually a dysfunctional business. Yeah. Yes, yes, right? That, that's right. And uh, quite a few, often they fall over when the, the founder is, you know, it's no longer able to, to, to run yeah, it. So it, it's got no long-term, you know, sustainability in there. Yeah. And they're lovely, beautiful people, but it's just flawed. Yeah. And so the number, you know, think, who's on your board? What, what skill sets do they do? Do a skill matrix, get these things, get people, you know, on who can actually support you and run this. Because yeah. otherwise you will not succeed. Yeah, so you really are lending your yeah. Yeah, your knowledge of, of a good business to that world. And if you were sitting in front of someone who you were trying to persuade, a picture an airport lounge, or you had a, a moment to try and persuade them to to get involved in philanthropy, what would be one of the stories that you would tell of, of what's been transformative for you? I, I think our Bali uh, situation with the, the... I mean, that's very stark there, yeah. when you think that, you know, the girls go into the fields at 10, all right, because they can't afford to go on to secondary school. So that, that's pretty much there. Yeah, uh, and, again, and you can conceptualise that so yeah, quickly. Really. Yeah. And, and one of the other things we talk about there, our model there is education to employment. So in these remote villages, we put in uh, classrooms and we teach English and computer skills after school. That guarantees them a job, basically, in tourism or practical skills. hospitality. Yeah. But those girls, those 20 are going into university each year, they have to go and teach in their village these two skills. Oh, 
great. And that has an that. incredible thing, inspirational thing of the younger girls in the and boys, for yes. that matter, in that village, seeing these people who've actually gone and doing Comes this. It's a real motivational modeling. thing. Yes. So it's those being able to motivate others. Yeah, yeah, and seeing that, this, that, yeah, that ripple effect. Mentoring and things like that. So, yeah, so, so mentoring is a real key thing of, of that. Yeah. But even before they get into the philanthropy, I talk to people about, you know, who are they mentoring, you know? Right, who, who are you talking to, who are you who encouraging? Are you and, who are you yeah. encouraging and all that? Yeah. Because if you start off with that, you actually get in the right mindset of that and you can le you'd lead yourself into philanthropy very quickly out of that space. That is superb. And that actually registers people more than actually the philanthropic thing about giving away money. Because they can picture having a conversation yeah. with someone and being able to lend that life advice or life experience. But you can also, who was an influence on you when you were young? and? And you know you, you're successful, obviously. Who was who mentored you? And it gets some thinking, and they go, "Oh yeah, gee, they did actually. And someone yeah. did this, and someone did that." I said, "Well, what are you doing?" Yeah, yeah. And, and then they uh, realise that yeah, they actually are at that time yeah. of life that they mm. could do that. That is a superb. Well, you have led a fantastically rewarding life. It seems like you've got a huge yeah. amount left to do as well. You don't seem like you've run out of ideas or enthusiasm. So it's been yeah. such a pleasure talking to you. Yeah. I could just keep talking, but I will. All right. I will end. And lovely to talk to you, Tabitha. Ah, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Sweet pleasure.